Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we are speaking with my good friend, Deborah Castellano. Deb is a fiction writer, blogger, witch, weaver, and author of Glamour Magic, which, if you're listening to the show on Podcast Thursday, was released yesterday. She hails from and lives in New Jersey, one of my very favorite states, and I don't care who knows it. Deborah, welcome aboard. Happy to be here. All right. Well, I know some of the uh, content in the traditional first question. So, Deb, for you, this will be pass fail. But uh, <laughs> were you a weird kid? I told my mom that that's your your first question, and she laughed. <laughs> Shout out to Fran. <laughs> um, yeah, I was kind of a suburban bird funeral having kind of kid. Bird funeral? Go on. You know, you'd find dead birds in your yard. And then, of course, you'd have to have a full funeral with all your neighborhood friends for them. And uh, so sort of like a very toned down Rasputina song. Nice. Nice. Is, is that, um, I mean, I find that interesting given some of the stuff we'll get onto a bit later, but it seems like uh, ritual was appealing to you at a young age. Yes, very much so. And I read uh, Dallaire's book of Greek myths, which is basically a Greek pitch picture book that converted almost everyone in my Druidic grove <laughs> to paganism um, that I have made a very big impression on me when I was young. And was that, I mean, did you find that in the library? We, did you grow up in a house that had loads of odd books? Um, I found that in a library, so that was sort of the, the DIY aspect of it. <laughs> and what do you think it was? I mean, was, it, was this a kind of, uh, what appealed to you about, I guess, the Greek myths? Well, the pictures in the book, um, because there were a lot of ladies doing things and horses and flying, and it seemed like a pretty good time. Um, and it seemed like it would be a fun thing to actually get to experience. <laughs> right. Okay. So, um, I mean, how old were you at that point? Oh, gosh. Um, seven, eight? Somewhere in there, like, and, you know, again, for the weird kid part, like my first childhood memory is uh, my grandmother's funeral. So, like, a lot of that kind of low-key weird is how I would describe it. Yeah, like a, like a ritual aesthetic. Yes, yes. And was it off to the races for you after that? I mean, do you think that was the kind of, uh, not that people are into things like, you know, grandparents dying, but was there something <laughs> about it that uh, you thought, actually, this is, I I'm into this, I'm into this kind of um, ritual aesthetic? I, I think so. I think so, because I remember um, back then they let you get real, real close at the uh, cemetery site, and we all threw flowers in, and I didn't want to throw mine in because I don't get flowers at, like, six, so... Um, but I did, and I remember it seeming, um, you know, you, you're seeing a lot of grown-ups cry for the first time um, when you haven't necessarily seen much of that in life. And it's like, oh, this is some real serious shit, you know, <laughs> and there was a lot of protocol to go with it. And is that, I mean... You uh, you and your mother and other family members do tend to, you know, semi-regularly visit the dead family members. Was this something that um, you kind of grew up around? Yes, that part for sure. Um, one of, again, another early memory is uh, Mama Fran teaching me how to make a rock garden at my uh grandmother's grave and um she has this whole elaborate system and she decides when she wants to go and spend the day at the cemetery basically it's always on the fly it's never like hey do you want to go in a week or two it's no i'm doing this today get in the car and i'm like i'd like a moment you know <laughs> and um it, it's always a very specific bunny trail of where you're going when and 
uh, yeah, that's that definitely started at a very young age. And uh, I mean, how many people do you see on these uh, impromptu graveyard days? It depends on how ambitious she's feeling. If uh, she's feeling really ambitious, we'll do uh, all of her side and then my father's side, but not my father because he's in South Jersey and uh, most of the rest of my family is in uh, Long Island, New York. So she sometimes will hit like most of um, her side is buried in the same cemetery, but my dad's side is uh, buried in a military cemetery semi adjacent to that. So um, when Zhao and I did a, a run on our own, it was, Oh God, it was just terrible. It was raining. We're trying to find like my cousin, Anthony, and we're like looking at the numbers, you know, that she never looks at because she doesn't need to. And we're trying to like locate everything and just making a mess out of it. Well, if they're semi adjacent, it seems like the most efficient thing to do is to hit up her side and and some of the military side then is that but did you manage to get long island and south jersey all in one day no but it was a whole weekend and man does that do something to your brain because it was just it was pizza and dead people and then like crummy diner food and dead people the next day and uh it, it really takes that long because we're probably um almost two hours away from my dad and then another two hours from my mother's side and my father's side but that's very dependent on traffic so sometimes you're in the car for four hours each way yeah so um why (laughs) um i if you asked her she would say it's just something that you do um I think she very much does not want to be forgotten and is worried that this will stop, you know, when she's on the other side. And I tried to get her to kind of split the difference a little bit that I'm like, hey, sometimes you got to show up to my house. I'm not always going to go to yours once you're on the other side um, because it's a long drive. But I, I do it because... It's a weirdly bonding experience with whoever you're going with, and you find out all sorts of crap you never knew about. Um, With my mom, I found out, apparently, I had a step-grandmother, great, no, great-grandmother, who is buried in an unmarked grave in that cemetery uh, due to some uh, issues with the will at the time. and I didn't know that prior to one of our jaunts where we were stuck in the car for quite some time. Um, prior to my uncle passing as well, it would also be something we would do when we would go out to see him. Yeah, so combine the living and the dead. It's interesting when you pull on that ancestor thread, the juicy stories you get uh, from the people who come with you. Oh, definitely. And it, it puts everyone in kind of a strange mindset that they're not usually in so sometimes some really interesting and strange things will come up it has with my my sister uh Zhao and i haven't done it enough together to to see what <laughs> spews forth from him but um it, it's the ritual aspect of it it's the um doing something to honor recent ancestors um and it's also the, the bonding and the food. It's a bit about the food too, because usually you go to like an Italian market, you go to like the best pizza place, you do a few of those things and it kind of adds a whole ritualistic aspect to the day. No, for sure. I mean, one of the things you mentioned there, let's take it back to the biography stuff and we found sort of the mythology and the ritual, but um, you mentioned, for instance, uh, that, your father is in a grave that's a couple of uh, hours south. So let's take mm-hmm. that story back because it seems like there's a, um, you know, a, something of a motif that goes along with your formative years. I yeah, um, I my mother at the time decided that she didn't want to go through the expense of 
burying him um, in a private cemetery uh, where the rest of my family is. Um, at the time, my sister and I were in high school. I think she was worried about a lot of financial things because uh, widow, widowhood kind of came up on her rather suddenly. So since my father had served in the military and there's no cost um, in the States, if you've served in the military to be buried in a military cemetery, she decided to do that. It's a decision I think she ultimately came to somewhat regret because it's made it a whole thing to get to everyone. Um, again, in sort of the morbid conversations you have when uh, my uncle was dying, we were talking to, um, uh, they work on headstones. And uh, the girl was very chatty with us. And she's like, oh, no, you don't want to buy a mausoleum because that's what we were talking about. Like I said, rather uh, jokingly, we'll go dig up daddy and, you know, put him where he belongs with everyone else. And then I can put you there, too. And then we don't have to worry about anything. And uh, so she, very accountant-like, started making inquiries about how much that would cost to do. And uh, apparently here uh, you have to build a mausoleum fully out of marble so it's about the cost of a house um, to do that and apparently when it leaks because it does it smells <laughs> it's not what you think it's going to be like I think of this very romantic Romeo and Juliet kind of situation not a leaking marble and uh, yeah, not a leaking marble cleaning. box of bad smells. That's uh, right. like if you're going to pay house money, it shouldn't smell like that. Right. And you have to do all your own upkeep and everything. It's it's crazy. It's a crazy situation. Well, so this is points for an ancestor altar. It's interesting you have that conversation with your mother because um, when my father comes down to visit here, I point at mine and go, yeah, there's a space for you right there. <laughs> <laughs> Right, like you're trying to preemptively train them to be like, you need to know where to go. Pretty much, pretty much, because we, I mean, Australia is a large place, so I'm, I'm kind of familiar, at least on mother's side, with the, uh, the spread outedness of the deceased. Right, right, exactly. So it's like you're trying to kind of clicker train them to be like, no, 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 you got to come here sometimes because I can't deal with this all the time. Um, so sometimes you'll get cannolis, but you got to show up. <laughs> Pretty much, pretty much. So that's, um, uh, it's funny that uh, what I enjoy talking to you about is the kind of uh, um, morbid death pragmatism, I think, because I remember we'd have discussions that you and Zhao have a game you play when you go shopping, which is the things you'll buy if one of you dies. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, um, a uh, April 2, the ex-opera singer and I talk about how as we get older, we get gother. Um, she married into a family that uh, she wound up, through her husband, inheriting uh, two, two small cemeteries, two small histor historical cemeteries. And uh, we spent a day at the beach, but the first thing we did was... Uh, go to check out her cemeteries and see what she was doing and working on. And uh, she has a corner she calls her crap corner where she keeps all her like uh, debris and stuff like trees that have fallen and whatever. Yeah. It's uh, I mean, it's, it's a good question to, to widen out a bit. Do you think um, obviously you do, but uh, it's a leading question in a way. Do you think that's healthy? Um, we've, I've sort of changed my family to, have kind of, uh, how to describe this, actuarial discussions at Christmas. So my parents have booked a cruise that was supposed to be the beginning of next year, but it's been delayed because the boat isn't done till beginning of the year after. And I said to my father, you could be dead by then. And he's like, oh, I could. And uh, and it seems to, to me to be healthy, but I can't tell if that's not. And should other people start doing this? I think other people are horrified by it, but I think it's it's something that's really helpful. I mean, my mom even uses it as like a, you know, oh, well, you know, you'll have plenty of money when I'm dead and blah, blah, blah. And I'll be like, yes, yeah, so if you could hurry it along, you know. Or give me the money uh, now. Like, it's a stick up. 
Right, right. And whenever she goes to, you know, uh, Atlantic City to, to go play the slots, I'm like, you know, you're spending all our inheritance. What are you doing? You know, and we we kind of joke about it. So it can be a way to discuss it. But we've also had some really serious discussions about, like, um, who she needs to make her medical proxy because that happened with my uncle Frank. Um, and that's things that make people very uncomfortable. There's this aura of this should be something that's very private and very personal and no one needs to know the details of. And um, unfortunately, my family, you either live for forever. Like I have a great aunt who's 96, who's outlived so many people, or you kind of drop dead at a young age, uh, sometimes fast out of nowhere, sometimes with a, a lingering disease. And it makes you ask a lot of questions that people who haven't been through that don't think to ask. And I think it's really good. You want to know what a plan is. It's Death makes a lot of people, myself included, feel very insecure and very unsafe and very like, I don't know what we're going to do. And if you could talk about uh, how you want a glass product coffin when you drop dead and four flower cars, it's a little bit of a joke, but it's also like, hey, um, you know, these are some things that I think I want. Like for a while, Zhao and I thought we wanted to be cremated because we'd figure we'd feel better with each other in the house. But I think ultimately we've decided to uh, be in the ground um, at my mother's side's cemetery. Do you think this is, um, do you think this discussion sounds, is there an Italian-American Catholic divide here? Like, is it, does it seem normal when you're talking to other Italian-American types in Jersey versus none? Oh, God. I went, I went to... Um, a close friend of mine uh, had his aunt die, and he's uh, another one of those where he's like lost his mother and his grandmother and his grandfather and, you know, like everyone. And, um, you know, uh, my best friend and I said we'd, we'd go to the the wake. And it's it was a very small thing. Um, and he's he's from a different um, cultural background than uh, myself and April One are. And um, first off, his entire family was late, which was a strange thing to us, but probably not to his family because they were probably figuring something out or spending some time together before they had to put on their their game faces. And uh, I remember April and I were getting ready to leave and they had a kneeler in front. So we're like, all right, um, we're going to pay our respects. And it, for us, it was a very brief time. Um, it was only uh, two, three minutes. We, we didn't even say, you know, a rosary or a decade or a chaplet, you know, anything. And, you know, afterwards, my friend said, what are you going to do? Are you going to crawl into the coffin with my aunt? You know, and I'm like, why would you put a kneeler there if you didn't want us to use it? That's not okay. That's weird. That's, a, that's really weird. <laughs> it's like, hey, but is it a display Catholic, purposes only? Do. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, I mean, it, interestingly, the the Catholic part is a good circle back to um, the autobiographical journey. So you found sort of mythology and 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 ritual appeal to you at an early age, but uh, you went down a um, at least initially more uh, pagan and, and magical journey. So tell me about when you found out that you could actually, you know, tell the story of how you found your path. Okay. So I I grew up. Catholic. Um, my mom always had this sort of laissez-faire attitude of you get your ass in the building, <laughs> you do what you're supposed to do, um, you try to be a good person, but the parts you don't like, eh, you could ignore those. And I couldn't. When my dad died, I'm like, I, I became uh, really upset with the the inequalities of it. I mean, we had a terrific priest, um, and I've been very lucky with my experiences with the church uh, overall. And, um, you know, I've had many good experiences, but I'm like, what's this crap that I can't be a deacon? And, you know, I started really studying and uh, while I was in college, and um, 
I needed for one of my uh, religion classes, I needed to go to um, a religious service that was not in my home religion. And my uh, best friend at the time, her stepmother, was uh, had a, a Dianic Wiccan uh, circle. So I said, all right, well, I couldn't make, I think they were all going to a Methodist church or something. Like anyone who wasn't Methodist was going to this uh, Methodist church, but I had some other commitment that night. So I'm like, all right, I'll go to a, a Dianic circle and I'll see how that is. And that's where it started to really sort of uh, take root for me. So, um, I mean, was it was a big part of it? It's interesting you mentioned the inequality component to the church. So, was a big part of the initial appeal like, oh, right, uh, <laughs> this is a way of doing things that resonates more with me? I mean, yeah, a little bit was like, you know, let's stick it to the man. I was I was 18 and, and women's studies and very, yeah, you know, about the whole situation. Um, but it literally never occurred to me, you know, that, that God could be a woman or that there could be many gods and goddesses of all kinds of genders. And um, I, I think... It was a really sacred thing for me to be in a space where we didn't have to have some dude tell us what to do. I like that. That's uh, you. You can definitely see the appeal of it there. So, is it you know love at first sight from from then on in, or I mean, did you explore other? Did that kind of start an avalanche of different explorations, or did you say, "Well, I'm going to kind of base myself here and see what happens." I mean, I was definitely exploring, um, but I have to be honest, for me, um, being Protestant didn't have a lot of appeal because you kind of just take out all the awesome parts, but I mean, on the other hand, many of the the Protestant churches have a much more uh, egalitarian situation, many are open to um, same-sex marriage, and a lot of the things I believed in, but I don't know, it always seemed like a lot of work. <laughs> and um, I, I really kind of resonated with the do-it-yourself aspect of um, paganism and uh, witchcraft at the time, um, and I happened to be really lucky to be in an area that had a lot of pagans. Like I could go to anything I wanted to. If I wanted to go to a blue star ritual, I could. If I wanted to go to an Osage thing, I could. Druids, they're in the town over. You know, like it was a ridiculous amount of of people practicing. So, I mean, having that much to choose from and that many people that I could ask a question at any given time. Um, really resonated with me because it wasn't just go to a place, listen to them talk. It was, you could have a really in-depth discussion about whatever it was you were thinking about. Yeah, we've spoken about this privately because uh, the next question is going to be about books and influences. But as you, you've pointed out, uh, and I'm, you, you still can't avoid the um, books question, but as you've pointed out, <laughs> uh, you, your formative time was quite fortunate and uncommon for people in a pagan space because you could actually talk to a sort of rainbow of practitioners who were evidently very patient with with the newbies questions they they were it didn't hurt that you know there was a lot of uh young college kids into it and i mean i i think it made a lot of them feel good that they could see the traditions being passed on some. So I think there was a certain amount of investment there that they wanted, um, they wanted young people to be interested in. If they were like, oh, go away, like that was going to shut it all down, you know? Um, so yeah, I know most, uh, most witches and occultists had read a lot of books, it seems, and and spent a lot of time alone. And I feel like kind of a weirdo that I'd be like, ah, oh, I wonder this thing. Okay, I'll go to like, you know, a, a picnic and I'll ask all the adults I know and see what they say and kind of go from there. Yeah, I, I don't have a frame of reference for it because my formative experiences were in regional Australia. So it was, you know, books from England and uh, and that was it. <laughs> 
I mean, hilariously, Zhao lived only maybe um, an hour, hour and a half away from me, but that was enough because I lived in a, a college town that his experience is much more similar to yours, which I just find really fascinating. Um, but to me, I, I feel like a little bit of a weirdo in that, that I'm like, oh, well, no, I didn't read a lot of books and do a lot of exercises there because I just showed up to things and whatever we were doing, I'd give it a go, you know? So, I mean, one of the reasons we had this discussion was that you ended up reading some of the, you know, the quote unquote classics much later on in your journey because they weren't formative at the beginning because it wasn't a book based exploration. With that being said, you are a writer. And yes. you are a practicing magician, so Correct. what are some of the uh, the actual book-based influences? What are the things that kind of resonated with you as you went through this journey? Um, I started out with Starhawk's um, Spiral Dance, because, you know, you kind of have to, especially as a Diana Quicken. Um, so that was my starting place. And then there's sort of like a long tequila soaked pause where I like I said just went to rituals and showed up essentially and um eventually though because everyone sort of gently chided me that you know get your shit together and actually read something um I really like uh Thorn Coyle's evolutionary witchcraft that really resonated uh with me I really liked the way she presented a lot of uh, her core concepts. And I, I really liked the, the Red Goddess. Um, that's one that you had recommended to me. And I, I really enjoyed reading it. Um, I liked uh, Jackie Smith's book. I think it's uh, Coventry Candles um, because she was very salt of the earth. Uh, same for Cora Anderson's for the same reason. Um, I liked Jason Miller's because it had a lot of uh, practical advice. Um, books that required a whole lot of meditation <laughs> and a whole lot of like very involved rituals um, generally kind of got discarded on my side just because I didn't have a lot of patience for that. Uh, the closest to ceremonial stuff that I do is a uh, new avatar power, which does weird things every time I do it. And, uh, but it's, it's interesting to me because it tastes like barf. Yeah. Okay. It tastes like <laughs> barf, like you have a weird taste in your mouth. When I do it, uh, I have that. I've I've learned with age because for a long time I thought I just didn't sense magic, but it turns out I do, but it comes usually in forms of like <laughs> physical distress instantly. Um when I was doing some of the rituals uh just a few days ago from there, um it, it did feel a bit like barf because I felt like I was shaking stuff loose and uh I believe I did, but unfortunately when you're shaking stuff loose, sometimes you're getting some of the debris at first. Yeah, it's a good way of describing it. That's uh, interesting. Um we should uh, here's, a, here's an interesting question to before we get to glamour in particular um before we get to what even am glamour uh why mm -hmm. glamour i mean i think the most succinct reason for for myself personally is um i grew up as the smart one in my house and my sister was the pretty one even though she was very uh smart as well and is um yeah, i was just listening to that thinking <laughs> no what no, she's hearing right now, now what she's hearing she right now kid, is like she's calling me dumb yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no um you know she did very well in school and she she did well um in her career paths and everything too um but I felt like that was something I sort of wasn't allowed to touch. Um, weirdly, not so much from my sister, um, more from the roles we were kind of cast into. And I was like, okay, well, if I can't be pretty, then what can I be? And could I be glamorous? And Dita Von Teese 
talks a lot about how artificial glamour is. And it's like, okay, well, if beauty is this very static concept where it's all about symmetry in your face and markers in your culture and things that you have like no shot in hell to do anything about, why not focus on the things you can do something about? And why not focus on the aspect of glamour that is that certain something about you? I mean, when you talk about people who are considered glamorous, it's not just that they're pretty or beautiful or whatever. They also have something about them. So that's an interesting um, uh, self-analysis there, because in many respects, I resonate with it, although on the boy version. Uh, Because, um, yeah, I I like the self-honesty about, well, obviously there was something about where I had to put myself in a family structure growing up if I'm not the sporty one and I'm not the, you know, this one or what have you. Right, right. There you go. That's, so, for me, do you think, well, let me just, let me turn that into a question then. So, do you think that sort of questioning led you into some of the earlier steampunk stuff and so on, looking at what a performative version of you might look like? I think totally, because I didn't know how to perform beauty. Um, I wasn't terribly great at that. I um, I always tend to be a little more uh, zaftag, you know, I'm not a, a tiny person. Um, and I think to me, I mean, going back a little further, um, I spent most of my 20s uh, going to goth clubs at night and uh at the time you were supposed to be totally into the music just like you were supposed to read all the books <laughs> um but i like the clothes i like the dress up aspect um of it and i got into the music because i like the dress up and then i think i was like okay what can i do with that and um i started thinking about how I had never had a lot of experience. Like I've never been to um, very many dance lessons or anything like that. Uh, Generally when I ran uh, salon con, there was tango or waltz or something like that. Uh, One of my mentors did seance and all these Victorian things that made sense to me because there was so much ritual to it and there was so much form to it. I thought, well, if I'm not, going to be conventionally beautiful and be able to go to like the meat market in New York City and, you know, have a total carry sex in the city sort of experience, which was about the time period we're talking, then uh, fuck it, I'm going to do it a different way. Yeah, I like that because I was looking for the word artifice, but you describe it as form. So there's a... uh Going back to what Dita Von said, if we're looking at uh, beauty as as a... platonic natural category there is something uh, structural and uh, and something about form that is associated with glamour rather than a uh, like if you're not if your limbs are too short or your face is too round that's uh, that's what happened <laughs> and and instead you right. kind of pivot towards um, either working with what you have or exploring form Absolutely, because like if we're looking, it, like there's this concept that beauty is supposed to be this natural thing, and I don't remember which comedian said this, um, but it was a woman, and she said like the minute a boyfriend says that he likes natural beauty, you know, like a Kardashian, <laughs> that she knows she's out, you know, and um, it's okay to not have it be all natural like if you're living in a time period where it's considered fashionable to have big boobs then you know that's why god made chicken cutlets you know (laughs) to stick in your bra um the glamour is kind of a workaround and i always kind of dug that aspect of it because you could uh you could only change so much but you could have really big false eyelashes or you could create an aspect of your your personality like you could focus on a specific thing do you want to be a shy ingenue or do you want to be socially awkward you know <laughs> like you can kind of choose how to frame it there's a lot more framing in glamour versus hot or not you know right so is that like we're going to 
do we land on that as a different definition between sort of beauty and and glamour? Um, I don't even want to say organic versus artificial, but like what, how, how in one sentence, how do we kind of nail the difference? Because first thing, if people haven't really sat with the idea for a while, in people's heads, the word glamour goes with Hollywood. Now, Hollywood is mm-hmm. the, the, like the center of artificiality, of course, but right. its messaging is around the idea. If you have a certain skin that glows under um, film lights, then you're more likely to be a starlet and, and, and so on. So people associate the word glamour with Hollywood, which they associate mostly wrongly with an idea of natural beauty. So how, how do we nail difference between beauty and glamour? I say, um, Beauty is and glamour does. I like that. That will work. So, um, is this, it's, it's a leading question, but it's because I want to have this as a discussion. <laughs> uh, uh, is this a female issue? I mean, it's, it's definitely currently more of one, but historically, no. Um, men were a lot more concerned with appearance and stuff. Now it's a bit more, how much money do you make? What kind of car do you drive? Um, But if we're looking back to uh, the Victorian time period and back further than that, or even as close as uh, the 1950s, if we're looking at more of that Mad Men kind of era, you were supposed to present yourself a certain way. And sometimes that meant you as a dude were wearing heels. And sometimes that meant you were wearing a tie. Yeah, if you're thinking about sort of Georgian dandies like Bo Nash, mm-hmm. they were the ones that were, they had the wigs and the heels. Uh, it wasn't the women <laughs> that had the wigs and the heels. <laughs> right, which seemed more correct to me anyway, because uh, men tend to have a better center of balance for that. So it sort of makes sense that it started out, you know, for men. <laughs> so how does that, I mean, let's um, let's talk man glamour then. So you, you mentioned things like cars and watches and so on. Is status a form of glamour or is status what people uh, – can it be? Or do people more often use status to maybe not explore the idea of glamour? Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm totally with you. And I, I think that people do often use uh, status to sidestep glamour, to sidestep having to really look at, um, I think for men especially, what makes you interesting and exciting to others. Because if you just sort of throw, I'm a lawyer and I have like, you know, a Porsche Boxer at it, like you don't have to really reflect on those questions. And society as a whole, especially in first world countries, sort of encourages that, you know, to not have to look at those things. And I think that does um, men a disservice for glamour because it, it doesn't give you a chance to shine in that way. It doesn't give you a chance to uh, take pride in yourself in that way. It doesn't give you a chance to explore those things like, you know, um, what kind of shoes you want to wear with what or uh, do you want to wear a suit? Do you want to wear something else? Maybe you're a bloke in a dress, you know, like it's doesn't it, it excludes it. I like I'm going to come back to that uh, take pride in yourself thing, because one of the questions is um, like, and funny enough, it's sort of a bit more of a boy question, but what's the point? Like, what, what do I get out? <laughs> do you know what I mean? I, I mean I'm sitting here now in a uh, Kingdom of Tonga souvenir T-shirt, which is stained <laughs> with what I hope is chocolate. And sweatpants <laughs> with a cigarette burn in them. <laughs> like, uh that's a, that's a good question. I'm going to leave it there. Like, what's the point? Um, what do we get yeah. out of it? Yeah, totally. And I'm I'm happy you asked it. So, like, uh, point you know, point blank, because uh, Zhao and I have been having intense conversations about that over the past few days. Um, I think, I think the point of it is, um, if you are a guy who is somewhat disempowered in some way. Um, whether it be because of uh, who you tend to love, whether it be because of your socioeconomic stand, uh, status, whether it be the color of your skin, you're not going to have access to all of this privilege all the time. And if you don't, you need to fight like a girl, you know? And 
that's sort of the point of glamour. I mean, yeah, when you could go to war and you had all the resources and all the political connections you needed to do that, yeah, sure. I mean, who wouldn't? But if you didn't, if you weren't considered a person for whatever reason, and you didn't have direct access to means, and you maybe still don't have direct access to means, it's a way to level the playing field. And I mean, if you are a sharp dressed man of color, that could open some doors for you that maybe would not have previously opened. Well, there's a chapter in the book titled, uh, You Don't Have to Like It, You Just Have to Do It. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, is that what we're talking about here, or what does that mean? I think we're talking a bit about that. I think we, we're coming to a place um, in culture where we feel like we shouldn't have to put on airs, quote unquote. We should just get to be ourselves, our most authentic selves. And we shouldn't have to dress a certain way. We shouldn't have to act a certain way. We should just be us. And I did that for a good chunk of my 20s. And let me tell you, if your most authentic self is anything like mine, it's an asshole. You know, um, there's something about trying for yourself, but also trying for other people. Like, for some reason, that is very taboo currently. Like, we are supposed to just be exactly as we are, and everyone can take us or leave us, and that's it. And that seems like a potentially lonely way to live. <laughs> It is if potentially if you want things out of life as well. My, I think I think we've discussed this before, but one of the many times I was unemployed in London, I noticed moving about the city. If I was on my way to job interviews, I'd be in a suit, and uh, you know, London and suits go together. But it's a crowded sure. city, and people would get out of my way. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other people in suits, um, what have you, people who, especially people who weren't in suits, and you'd kind of move through a crowd in a way if you were casually dressed, there's a, there's an unconscious status association, which, which I didn't have. I was unemployed, right? So, but right, I was unemployed right. in a suit and people <laughs> would get out of my way because I'm walking around central London in a suit. And that is kind of what I resonate with when you say you don't have to like it, you just have to do it because actually you don't have to do it, but what do you want out of life? Exactly. And I mean, let's take it a step further. When you were unemployed, and, and I, I too have been unemployed, and it feels kind of crummy, and you're in a suit and people are treating you um, at a certain status that you know you're not, isn't that a bit thrilling? Um, yes, I just enjoyed having um, less crowded sidewalks. That was the thrill for me. I'm like, goodness, <laughs> I'm, I'm making such good time. <laughs> exactly. I mean, but it's also a little bit of that you're kind of putting something over on someone in a harmless sort of way. You knew you were unemployed, but the people on the street didn't, you know? It's possible at the time I wasn't thinking about it in, in that way. I was thinking more... Like I'm in disguise. So I guess the thrill there right. for me was um, getting away with fraud, I guess. <laughs> yes, but that's what I'm saying. And I mean, like, that's all. No, 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 don't do that. That's, that's not nice. But there are harmless things. If someone interprets your status as higher than it is, it's a bit thrilling. Um, I remember once in my 20s, I was... Uh, I went into Tiffany's, um, and this was a time that Tiffany's was like a very she-she, like middle-class status symbol to have. And uh, I was wearing like a PVC coat and just totally gothed out because why not? And um, I remember when I asked about a certain necklace from the catalog, the look on the woman's face, and then she said, I'll go in the back and get it. And I felt like I won something. Right. I, uh, my, I guess my version of that, again, it comes back to getting away with fraud. Um, it, it, it feels like I'm tricking people in like airline lounges where people are being nice to me. And I'm like, you, you think, <laughs> you think I belong here? Yeah. So is that, I mean, I can see why the chapter's in the book, because when we talk about looks and appearance, uh, particularly in sort of magic and magic adjacent communities um in many respects they're formed through at least in part like rejecting the idea given that they uh that these are uh i guess priorities culturally because mm -hmm. 
potentially the confusion between things like you know beauty and glamour and uh and advertising and 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 what you know what bodies should look like in in the 21st century in the west um so it's i mean how 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 do we or how do you specifically get people to to think about that differently kind of more like what we're talking about I mean, I, I do think that's an uphill battle for sure um, in the community. And I think part of that issue is that people feel like they're going to be made to do something they don't want to do, that they're going to be put in drag in a negative way, that they're going to be forced to wear clothes they wouldn't want to wear. Um, an example I use is I do work um, in the financial sector and it's a very conservative fir firm and they've known me for a very long time and um i the idea of of dressing like um you know effie from skins where she's working in finance and she looks great in it but like that that suit pants with a blazer and a button-down shirt and a silver necklace and heels and my makeup done a certain way, my hair done a certain way, makes me want to die. <laughs> you know, it's not what I enjoy, but I found I could kind of sort of get away with, if you will, uh, with kind of a sort of quasi madman sort of look where it's, you know, big poofy uh, cupcake skirts and... Uh, little black dresses with uh, lots of uh, costume jewelry and everyone would say I looked very uh, feminine. There were lots of lace and frills and that's what I like. And that's not what everyone likes. Some people are more comfortable with that kind of businesswoman look. But the point is, is you have to find what you feel comfortable with. You can reject what's going on uh, currently in fashion, in the media, in whatever, and still have a sense of style. I mean, you could wear nothing but jeans and a black tank top year round, and that could be your signature look. You have to, you have to frame it right, and you have to see that there's a value in presenting yourself in a way that's acceptable to the people around you, but also something that you feel comfortable and like yourself in. So there's a great answer. Uh, and it just kind of, I guess, cause I had some specific questions, you know, asking for a friend style. Uh, but we have, <laughs> we have been talking about glamour in the sense of um, what to wear and, and, and the sort of visible surface of it. Does it extend beyond that and how? It definitely does. Um, if we're being real blunt about this, um, and this is something that is, again, also somewhat frowned upon, uh, you can use your glamour to manipulate people around you. Um, and that's, again, a very taboo topic, even in the uh, occult community. But the truth of the matter is, is we're all kind of doing that most of the time anyway. <laughs> it might be small things like uh, getting your spouse to pick up milk on the way home or telling your kid it's time for bed and it's an hour earlier than it their bedtime is. Uh, but they can't tell time, so joke's on them. <laughs> I mean, we do all of these these small things to make our lives easier. And when you use your glamour in that way, you can do that too. You can also use your glamour to open doors for opportunities. You can use your glamour to get people to help you who maybe would not otherwise do so. And it seems, I mean... And a lot of this is, is to do with, I guess, historical misogyny, but this was, and presumably still is, a traditional witch power. Absolutely. And that's, that's why, while it's a feminine sort of magic, it's something everyone can use. If you're disempowered, this is how you get the things you need, you know? And it's, it's, it's Deborah and JL from the Old Testament. It's, uh, you know, um, Anne Boleyn. It's so many historical people. Um, but it's, it's how you get things done when you don't have the means to do so. There's a sort of Bella Figura element to it. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's um, I, I'm going somewhere with that, which is uh, my father, before he retired, was a psychiatrist and he, he worked in drug and alcohol. And one of his clients was, uh, ages ago, he told me this story, was a gang member. And in Australia, that means motorbikes, you know, um, not uh, American style gangs. And he was going to court. Right, right. He was going to court and um, my father asked his client, like, what are you going to wear? And it was essentially like, you know, leather jacket probably a gang color bandana and my father right. <laughs> my father's like well what's the magistrate going to be wearing and this guy says a suit and uh and what's the prosecutor going to be wearing and i think a suit and uh, and what am i going to be wearing and he's like a suit <laughs> so i'm going to ask you again <laughs> what are you going to be wearing and uh and there's a kind of the uh whether that's manipulation or i, I don't think it is i think it's um it's that do you how much do you want something and how yeah. what are you going to throw at it other than you know just magic or hope i mean do you want do you, do you want to get off this conviction uh, what thing do you want right and i mean if if he was a dude who didn't really care about that like you know that he's in and out of jail and half his bros are in there anyway he might be like well i don't care i'm going to be me and that's more important to him than you know, not serving time. If he happened to be, say, like a, a young dad, he might be like, you know what? I don't want to see my kid to see me incarcerated. I'm going to play the game. And that's a big part of what glamour is. You are choosing how you engage with the game. Well, yeah, because interestingly, we can reframe your example of it uh, as a, uh, if, if we decided to go in wearing, you know, um, shall we say, his street attire, that's still right. glamour, because if his goal is to get into... Well, no, his goal is to get into prison. <laughs> but if if he sees the upside of going to prison, then there's the glamour component of, like, well, he stayed uh, he stayed in colours the whole way through, and now he's here. And in a strange way, that's also glamour? Absolutely, because now he's going to be, like, a head honcho when he goes to jail. Jail. So, yeah. I mean, if that was his goal, then mission accomplished. And and that's the thing that, um, to me, is really interesting about Glamour. It requires really radical self-honesty, because if you can't be really, really real with yourself about what you're trying to accomplish here, it, it it's going to be useless. I mean, you have to really have your eye on whatever that prize is in that particular interaction. And also, and funnily enough, this is where we um, we take the questions next. So that's neatly teed up. You also have to be honest with yourself, um, and and that's why I'm going to ask: like, what are some suggestions given the kind of uh, people who listen to this show and the communities that they come from? What are some suggestions for kind of straddling that line? Uh, again, it's an asking for a friend question uh, between coming <laughs> to terms with body image and self improvement, because there's a there's a risk of getting glamour. I I perceive a risk in um, interpreting glamour as like as you said, like oh you can be whatever you want, just be the best version of that possible. And whilst that's true, mm -hmm. we can also be better. So like how how do people start thinking about that and what are some suggestions, even practical ones, that you know, you could sort of put out there for people kind of straddling that line? I think you have to figure out um, where your baggage is and why. And um, I think going from that, you have to some of the best advice I got about planning a wedding is that you have to pick basically two hills you're willing to die on. Like these are your bottom line. Like you will not budge like whatever, you know, crazy shit happens between uh, the, the event planner, your mother, your, your mother-in-law, whatever. These are the things that you will not budge on. And you can pick those. Maybe yours is, I will never wear eyeliner. I will never have short hair. I will never have long hair. Whatever it is. But if the rest of it doesn't mean that much to you, figure out how to use it. You know, uh, every tool is a weapon if you hold it right. And part of that is how you appear, but it's also knowing how to be glamorous, how to charm people, how to use your glamour magic in those situations. Um, you have to know when to give things the shove and when to let it 
ride and to see what what happens. And that's something I think I've only really started to get a handle on as a a magician in maybe the last year or two. Um, Sometimes you have to figure out if you want to see how the work you've already done plays out or if you want to shove it. Yeah, so there's... um Find, figure out where your baggage is and experiment, I guess. Because there will be people listening to it who are, like, well and truly in the uh, self-image hole. Like, th- this is not for me because I'm, you know, fill in the blank. And is that, so do we go baggage, work out what you find your hills to die on and experiment? Like, because for me, yeah. like, that's basically it. Just play uh, and and work out what's good about you now so it's it's actually performative initially because i think people get lost in their heads when when it, when that sort of when they're in that self image well yeah yeah i mean like i i think i to the bottom of my heart i really feel glamorous for everyone like i've advised people you know who don't fit any kind of traditional role of glamour and i think like when you don't fit it when you don't look like one of the girls of sephora when you don't look like marilyn monroe when you don't have a certain body this is where you get to really embrace the outsider aspect of glamour that's where it gets really exciting to me um because like you said it is a bit of a performance at first but then you figure out what you like and what you don't like. Um, So like, let's say you don't, whatever gender you are, have a taboo against wearing some eyeliner, put it on, see what happens. You know, like nobody's grading you, you know, cosmetics were given to us by fallen angels. You should take advantage and do something with it. Is that, um, is that a way through? Cause I'm still, I'm still not sure we've, um, is that a way to let me go back to the question before it mm-hmm. to find that line between um where you are now and self improvement do you almost do it randomly by exploring what things <laughs> kind of work and don't because it's 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 kind of fraught especially if you're like okay well i want to be glamorous i but i need to lose 20 pounds like, well maybe you do but can you be glam like how do you right. how do you have that idea how do i i need to lose 20 pounds I also need to be glamorous now. Like, how do you manage Part those two it, things at once? Yeah, because that is currently my hell that I'm dealing with. <laughs> um, well, you you kind of have to live a bit in a dual reality where it's um, I'm not a piece of shit because I'm not 20 pounds lighter um, and framing your body to yourself like I'm very self-conscious about my upper arms and um, if I frame it a bit more like well in Anna Karenina (laughs) that was very admired plump upper arms um, throughout the book maybe it's not so bad at the same time I needed to uh, get a nutritional coach to basically yell at me almost every day about whatever I'm fucking up so it's this sort of dual reality while you're working through it because I don't feel like I'm not glamorous right now. I mean, I wrote a book about about it Um, and I feel like I present myself in the way that I would consider to be glamour. At the same time, I know I feel more comfortable in my body about 20 pounds lighter. So I have to be comfortable enough that I can stand it right now, but then keep my eye on the prize to get to where I'm trying to go. Yeah. I think that's the bit um, I'm I'm sure for a lot of people, (laughs) especially if it's it's really unsuccessful to change things. It's really hard to do that. I mean, I haven't been super successful in weight loss. You know, I I'm still nowhere near like my quote unquote goal weight. Um, It's a very difficult thing to do, but if you can figure out how to manage it for yourself, it becomes possible. And I think, as you kind of say, like the first step on that is to uh, find find those kind of glamour points or the, the outsider points initially. And <laughs> so it's like a dual project. 
Yeah, because like you can also think, okay, well, what women like in my case talking about, you know, my weight issues, you know, what women of size do I admire? What dresses look flattering? You know, it's dressing the body I'm actually in, not just the body that I want to someday be in. How can I dress my body right now to look really fabulous and to feel really good in it you know at the same time no you do not need three glasses of wine every night as per sarah my very strict coach i was about to say agree to disagree right i know (laughs) i mean she is cruel (laughs) but you know you have to figure out how bad do you want it like it's it's that uh, in my french aspirational books that i spent all of my unemployment reading that they say uh french women supposedly you can probably validate this better than than i could um you know think to themselves do they want the donut or do they want to uh, stay at the weight that they're currently at? And sometimes the answer will be, I want the donut. So fuck yourself, you know? Yeah. That's a, it, it's the same with French men as well. It, um, control is a cultural hobby. So it, demonstrating yeah. it and, and making it feel, uh, making it appear effortless is, is very French. Watching five people at a cafe like sit on the same bottle of wine for six hours when James and I on our own are like 10 bottles in. <laughs> at that point. Like, I'm yeah. so terrible about it. I'm like, what are we doing here? <laughs> 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 but you know, exactly. You have to figure out what, how badly you want anything at any given moment. And you have to think, what am I willing to do to get it? And that's, hard to be present with that all the time but if you can be as much as possible like um today has been an emotional day for me because of my book release but um one of the things i do in my workplace is i answer the phone i cannot sound like a hot mess i have to pull my shit together and i take like a beat and then i don't know where it comes from probably some kind of glamour well somewhere in there and i have a very good phone voice it's being able to do stuff like that. You're you're trying to really exert your willpower and your literal will over what you're trying to accomplish. I think in a um, that which is convenient because we've been talking for an hour. That kind of neatly sums up coming back to what's even the point of glamour, which is well, as with anything else, almost no, like technically nothing. There's no point to anything. But how much do you want yeah. something, and what are you going to throw at it? And that's where I think it fits as an under-examined uh, a weapon in the arsenal for people who are at least, like, if you're willing to um, practice magic and go by the demons for things. Uh, right. You can't slap on mu- some lipstick. Like, you know? Yeah. How, how, much, how much do you want something? And, and that's, that's a sort of eternal question of, uh, I guess, anyone in, in occult spaces. It's like, well, do you want it or not? And, and, and by how much? And, uh, and I think that's, it's, it's a really interesting and, uh, timely exploration, I think, I think. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I agree. Nice one. Well, Deb, for people who obviously would like to know more, uh, where would they go to find out about the book and yourself and, and all that kind of thing? They, uh, lay your contacts on us. Sure. The The best way to find me would be at my blog, which is Charmed, I'm sure. Um, its address is charmedfinishingschool.com, and you'll be able to get all the information about my social media, uh, my book, and uh, hear me rant about various glamour-related uh, issues. Nice one. Well, uh, obviously, this will all be linked up in the show notes and, and so on, but... Um it's been a pleasure and congratulations. We got to talk the day your book came out. So super congratulations. And, uh, and I hope everyone out there goes and uh, has a look at it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was really great to get to uh, do this together on uh, book launch day. Some Jersey strong talking this week. Death customs, learning by doing, examining your baggage, and working out what it is you really want both now and later. Glamour's a challenging topic for a lot of us, and I include myself in that, because it's an unavoidable, performative exploration of the things you maybe don't like about yourself, and whether you're going to let those things rule your life. 
We didn't get time to talk about its presence in folkloric depictions of magic, but it's reasonable to suggest its ubiquity is an indicator that we've been thinking about Glamour's role in magic for a very long time. So definitely check out the book if that's your jam. Also check out runesoup.com and or subscribe to the show on YouTube or in your favourite podcatcher. Otherwise, find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.